All right, looks like we are live. So welcome everybody to what is the fourth of our virtual tastings. Hi, I'm Mick Schroeder. I'm the director of working for Sonoma Couture. Today, uh, I've got a really cool um, afternoon for you. I'm here with my mates from Corbell. And uh, before we get going, uh, we'll do some introductions. So Paul is the director of winemaking here at, uh, at Corbell. Well, welcome, Mick. Yeah, glad to have you here. We're practically neighbors, just 10 minutes up the road here from Petraire, and uh, we're here in lovely Russian River Valley on an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. It is drop dead gorgeous, yeah. unbelievable. Luckily, we got the umbrellas. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. About, about you. Corbell or about me? Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, Corbell's been around for you know since the 1860s as a logging camp, and then in the 1880s as a winery. You know, I got here in uh, 1985, and I, I think it's kind of cool because I started my job here at Corbell literally on April Fool's Day, 1985. <laughs> so I figured if it didn't work out, well, it was just a joke, you know. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, I mean, 35 years later, I'm still here, so it can't be too bad. Working out for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, working out real good for me. Uh, no, it's a, it's a family-owned company here. Uh, the Heck family owns it, and, and they've treated me really good. Uh, again, I'm here in lovely, you know, Russian River Valley. I've got just a beautiful view out of my office in the morning, and uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a great place to be. A lot of pe great people here, and uh, I love making bubbles. Yeah, it's really a lot of fun. I mean, you know, most winemakers they only get to ferment their wine once. I get to ferment mine yeah. twice. So. <laughs> well, we look forward to tasting the uh, the the Brook Rose a little later on. Yep. So. Yep. And then the real star of the show uh, is is. Emily. Um, so she's going to be doing a, a cooking demonstration. So say hi. I'm Emily Lamb. I'm the director of hospitality here at Corbell. Uh, I've been here about six years and I love it. I love it here. This is my view every day. My office is right nearby. So I am also very, very lucky with my, my view here. Uh, I am a kid of a chef who is also in the Sonoma Couture family. Kind of a fam famous guy, he's isn't he? Famous. Yeah. He's, he's a good dad too, so it pays yeah. off. But uh, he's a uh, John Ash is my awesome father, and he's, as you know, kind of a part of, like I said, the Sonoma Couture family and a wine country chef. And so I um, have learned everything I know pretty much from him and have grown up in the restaurants from here to New York City to Los Angeles and worked my way back to the wine country. And here I am, and I get to oversee our culinary team here, which is totally fun. So, uh, yeah, I'm in heaven here. Excellent. <laughs> Good. 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 So we're coming to you live today from the Corbell Winery. And I've got to tell you, this place is spectacular. It is drop dead gorgeous. So when some of these travel restrictions get lifted, if you're coming to wine country, you've got to make this a destination. It is just superb. The gardens here, the winery with all the ivy on it, um, the tasting room, they have a, a deli. You can get sandwiches and all sorts of stuff. So uh, on your next trip to uh, Sonoma County, um, come and visit these guys. Yeah, it's spectacular. Especially if you come in uh, like the late spring or early summer months, you know, next year probably. Uh, <laughs> but we have beautiful gardens here. So it's not just the winery either. You know, we have absolutely amazing antique gardens here that have been maintained in the same basic style as, as was back in the 1880s. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, um, I didn't talk too much about myself, um, but we have done, as I mentioned, this is the fourth in the series. So, if you uh, if you want to go back and watch today's uh, um, program or the previous three, um, they'll be out on YouTube for goodness knows how long. So, um, but uh, just to clarify one thing, um, and we probably will get some questions. Um, I neglected to introduce Margie. Margie's sitting um, behind us here, so behind the scenes, and uh, she's probably not likely to come out and say hi, but um, say hi from your perch there. Hello, thank you for joining us. And she is like about one foot away from the pool, one false move, <laughs> and she's going in the drink. We're so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so Margie's manning uh, the laptop. And because this is a, a live feed, type in any questions um, that you've got for us and she'll relay the questions as we uh, as we go along. So um, the, the plan of attack for today, we're thinking pink. Uh, we've got Mother's Day on Sunday. 
So Paul and I are going to talk about uh, the two wines um, that we think are going to be perfect for Mother's Day and a great pairing uh, with the dish that Emily is going to prepare. So uh, Paul's got his Brut Rosé and then I've got our Russian River uh, Valley Pinot Noir Rosé. Uh, so without further ado, Emily, the show yeah. is yours. Okay, let's see if I can pull this off. Uh, so today I'm going to make a Strata and Strata, I guess, from looking it up, it comes from something to do with layering of rock sediment or something like this. But obviously, I'm not layering rocks. I am layering food. Um, it's a really easy dish. It's great for Mother's Day. It's a good one that if you are wanting to bake for the mom in your life, you could put it together the, the night before, throw it in the fridge, pull it out, and it takes about um, 50 or 60 minutes to bake. But it puffs up. It stays really nice. I love it because I am also a mom of two little boys and. I love having something that I can just go to and eat that is not the crust of grilled cheese or something along those lines <laughs> or mac and cheese or any other items with cheese. So I'm always happy when there's adult food I can continue to eat. So anyway, my, forgive me, it is a little warm out here. So my butter is melting a little. So um, I'm going to do my best to start with our strata here. Actually, I'll just show you a couple of quick ingredients. Basically, it's a layering of egg, bread, mine is veggies. You could use sausage. You could use bacon. And you could kind of ad lib and you can use whatever's in your fridge, freezer, AK, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, here is my bread. This is from our deli. These were leftover sandwich rolls that were not used. I've used hamburger buns at home, all kinds of things like that. Uh, I've already sauteed a few onions here just with a little salt and pepper and butter. Best smell ever. Sauteing onions makes people think you've worked really, really hard on something. And all it is is onions and butter. <laughs> uh, I've sauteed a little spinach. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it tastes great. Also, just olive oil, a little salt and pepper. Uh, and these are shiitake mushrooms, which I have sauteed, again, in butter. So it's not exactly a low-cal dish, but uh, there you go. Um, so I have all my ingredients here. I'm uh, Typically, my butter would be a little colder, forgive me, and I would be using it to butter the dish. I'm going to simulate that a little bit with my spoon here. And basically, you're just wanting to get a nice coating just so that things don't stick when you're baking it because it will bake, like I said, for almost an hour and those kinds of things you know, they tend to stick. So I'm buttering away here. <laughs> That's a lot of butter in this warm weather here. <laughs> Forgive me, but hey, everything's better with more butter. Next, we're going to go for the bread, which also is toasting here in this warmer weather, but it's going to get a whole bunch of eggs and milk and things on it. So it's going to be fine. Basically going to pack it in the bottom here. And you can kind of go ahead and pack it tight. It's going to turn into kind of a custard sort of situation. So we've got that there. Uh, I'm taking my larger bowl and I'm just going to take everything I've sauteed and throw it together and give it a good mix. So there goes all my mushrooms. And I'm going to find a place for that nice. bowl. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Vanna. <laughs> I'm getting hungry, so I want you to, I want you to pick onion. up the pace. <laughs> I know. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. No. <laughs> Basically just going to kind of give these all a little toss, kind of mix them up so that they spread evenly in there which these are like three of my, I mean, I could do almost anything with mushrooms and spinach and onions and eggs and bread for that matter. Uh, so basically it's a little like a lasagna. We're just going to kind of, you know, spread this out as evenly as we can. I'll be honest. I actually think frozen spinach works better today. I had fresh. Um, so that's what I use, but the frozen spinach already has the uh, moisture taken out of it, which is really nice. So then you're not left with a bit of a soupy kind of business there. Um, anyway, just one thought, but Certainly the fresh works really well too. So I'm layering away. I'm just gonna simulate well, we're just gonna kind of do that. <laughs> Go for it here. Very elegantly done. You know, it's it's very um scientific, this whole thing. <laughs> so there we go there. And cheese. <coughs> Important thing, right? Gruyere cheese. Anything better than a bunch of shredded Gruyere cheese. So again, a little like a lasagna, <clears throat> just layering away the calories here, um, delicious calories. And then we do bread again, kind of like your pasta layers. And again, you can kind of pack it because when we get the egg mixture there, it's going to puff up. So it does kind of puff up. It's very uh, quiche-like or bread pudding, something along those lines. So we've got that there. I'm going to get rid of this all here. <laughs> and here I have 10 eggs hanging out. This is four cups of milk. I'm just going to go ahead and add in there. 
which always seems like a lot of milk to me. This is one thing my dad said, you can always adjust it however you want. You know, you want it to be um, to your taste. If you like things a little more moist and you like it more quiche-like, you could add a little more milk. If you like it a little more bread pudding-ish, a little less milk. So you can, you can adjust this whole thing to however you want. So I'm whisking away on these guys. And this is basically, it's sort of part of the mother sauce um, bracket, if you will, that I'm going to add a little Dijon mustard and a little fresh grated nutmeg here. So let me give this just a tiny bit more of a whisk. Okay. And oops. <laughs> we'll just set this aside messily here. And in goes my Dijon mustard, which is pre measured out there. And also my nutmeg, which just gives it a really nice, I can picture again my dad teaching me how to make these things and saying gives it a real depth of flavor and, and it does. <laughs> so, uh, the only thing I'm not adding, forgive me, is salt and pepper. And basically to all of these, you can add salt and pepper to taste. I would add a little salt and pepper to this. I did add salt and pepper to my uh, veggies as I was cooking them. And again, just to taste. Some people like more salt. My husband gets mad at me because I like salt and he doesn't. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> but, so now my little mixture is done here. Again, forgive me. Kind of make it a mess. And basically from here, we are just going to ladle this on. And once you get to a point that you're comfortable to dump it on there, you can. I was wondering about that. Uh, <laughs> are you going to dump it? Are you going to ladle? Will, yeah, it's a little like the veggie uh, issue I had. I was very, <laughs> you know, thoughtful about it for a minute or two. And then I went, eh, screw it. I'm just going to dump it here. <laughs> so, so as soon as I think I won't just spill it everywhere, then I will dump it. But... But that truly is about it. The last thing I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to dump. Emily, while you're dumping, yes. uh, what size is that pan that you're using? This one is a 9 by 13 or 9 and a half by 13 is kind of what they usually uh, call it. And you can really, like, use any dish you want. You will, I think, see in a moment um, that the ones that I made for the winemakers are uh, in little ramekins. You could do little individual ones. You could do this in muffin cups. Um, just make sure, like I said, to do a better job than I did of buttering or oiling your pan because it will, it does stick pretty good. So um, last thing here is just a little more delicious Gruyere cheese. My recipe, I think, had all of this. I measured it out. So we'll just continue the dumping process and push away there. And voila. Uh, well, that's it. So now you're just going to bake it in the oven? Well, let's just see what it would look like here. If Oh, my God. There's one baked right here. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the baked finished dish. Um, I love it. It's uh, like I said, I think my favorite thing is that it, um, that it, uh, it holds well, that you can eat it a lot. So, And I love this. This is, um, you know, use whatever dish you have. This is, you know, one of our kind of funky older ones here. Pyrex is great. Ramekins are great. Muffin tins, any of that. Personally, I like it when it gets a little crisp on. I like it's. I like that on lasagna as well. The kind of corners, um, and then you can just kind of scoop it out and serve. You can be more perfect and kind of cut a little corner. But I'm just gonna. It looks fantastic. Yay! Yeah. And right. hopefully, it tastes that way too. Emily, how long did you cook that, and at what temperature? I cooked it at uh, 350 degrees for depending on your oven, about 50 to 60 minutes. Okay. So, uh, and then you'll have this lovely little egg dish here. Um, that's kind of ready to go. It'd be great with a little salad on the side. Uh, you could just, you know, pop a little salad there, a little flour for mom's day, which would be cute. Um, and I think that's about all I got on the strata there. So yeah. we actually got to taste this a little bit earlier and I got to tell you, it was fantastic. But uh, funny, um, my daughter Sadie, uh, last Sunday, she got up early, 10 o'clock in the morning, and um, and surprised my wife with uh, with bubbles and for breakfast. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. We didn't have the heart to tell her that oh, no. it's next week, honey. <laughs> so, Sadie, if you're watching, this Sunday, this would be a great dish to, to do for mum. And what mum wouldn't like to Mother's Day twice in a year? Hey, that would be good. <laughs> So anyway, let me move these guys here. Um, the only thing I didn't really talk about that I don't know if you want to touch on, Mick, is kind of pairing with this. And certainly the rosés should be a fantastic pairing with this. The mushrooms, yeah. 
with the Pinot. I'll, I'll pass it to you. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I'm going to throw it back oh, to you. Uh -oh. So <laughs> if you were going to do something yes. other than the bubbles and, the, right. and our rosé, what would you do? Well, it's, again, so funny that you should ask because I have all of these berries and melons here and oh i oh my probably, god what are the chances you know, of that really i'm amazing what can i say <laughs> <laughs> so i uh the drink that we sent out to folks is something well let me get rid of all these casserole dishes here hold please while i get rid of all these guys and emily while you're moving your uh dishes well, around there one last question can you just repeat uh what the bread was again that was just um, French rolls. They were like sandwich rolls from our deli. Um, a soft French that I just cubed about yay big. I think you saw them before, hopefully. Yeah. But they don't necessarily, the bread doesn't have to be fresh either. You were saying no, it was not. A, a day or two old. It's actually kind of better. It's like French toast. It's actually a little better. Oh, okay. If yeah. it's got a little something to it. That is a good it. tip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. A great way to use things up. So let me get out my other items here for a lovely little cocktail that I would say is kind of a I don't know it's kind of a mix between eating your fruit and having a having a drink with your fruit there and I titled it a fruit cocktail in quotations because I kind of had that dole fruit cup in mind <laughs> that has the syrup and things in there that maybe it's a little nostalgic in that way or something so let me just get a couple more little items out here and if you're a mimosa fan this is just like a little extra touch to your mimosa. Uh, basically, forgive me again, my, my mint is going a little sad, but we are going to chiffonade a little mint, which I'm truthfully not the best at doing a chiffonade in the classic sense, but. In layman terms, what is that? Chop. <laughs> I'm going to chop some mint. Um, I'm going to attempt, I should say, I'm going to attempt to chiffonade mint because I don't think I've ever done it super successfully but basically you can do this with basil with mint um, if you kind of flatten them together and stack your leaves and then you try to roll them ah. let me find my knife <laughs> there's my knife it's really hard to cut things with <laughs> there we go so once it's in its little roll you can just as finely as you can there just kind of slice through it and basically you just want it to you know sprinkle a little bit of flavor on whatever it is you are doing there Personally, I think this also creates some long strings of basil or mint or whatever you're doing. Some people leave it that way. It's nice on pasta, but in a drink, I would give it one more cut through. So I would just kind of give it a little extra chop. Amazing extra how the chop. aroma of the mint just Isn't it? Pops, it's the best. Cut. Yeah. It's like the onions. You know, yeah. you really make people think you're doing something yeah. and you're really not doing very much. So. <laughs> uh, so really all I'm doing here for this sparkling fruit cocktail is I have a little agave syrup. Uh, measured out here. So I'm just going to throw that in my little bowl here. Uh, I have a little fresh squeezed orange juice. This is enough pretty much, for, well, I guess it depends how you use it, but this would be like one whole cocktail or, or well, you'll see in a second. So, uh, and then I'm just going to kind of sprinkle my little cute little mint leaves there. I'm going to take my very cute little, I've been referring to this as a cocktail whisk, but I guess I've been making too many cocktails with, um, that involve a whisk. I don't think very many people are whisking cocktails, but you know, whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to use the very delicious, very appropriate for this weather, uh, Brut Rosé here. And I'm going to add it in here. You could add just this over your fruit and then pour this on top. You can kind of do whatever you want here, but... And then you dump it in the glasses, I'm assuming. So exactly. Like... We'll see how that goes. <laughs> we'll see. I'm not exactly sure that my dumping techniques are going to be super stellar. I might need stellar. to stand back to that. I know. You know, <laughs> I'm really making a mess of our whole bar here, but I'm going to add a few little berries there. I am. Um, this is just uh, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Did I say raspberries? Sorry. Uh, and I did a little melon. This is watermelon, cantaloupe, and a little honeydew. And again, it's like a play on a mimosa, a play on sangria, something along those lines. Um, and you can pretty much, like I said, add as much champagne as you want. If you just want a little and you want to make it more like a dressing and you're going to serve this in a bowl with just a little teaspoon on there, it's delicious. Just adds a little extra life to it. And if you want to make it... Well, let me attempt to show you that. I think, I think we're get but I think it's good. Well, I was going to get there. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> So let me get my whisk down again. <laughs> we'll do a little bit. And like, well, I really don't trust the pouring that I'm about to do, but 
Oh, went better than I thought. Yeah, good job. Sort of. Um, so again, it could be like this. You could serve with a spoon. You could serve, you could just drink like a sangria and then you'd have this delicious fruit that's been soaking in fruit rosé and orange juice and mint and agave and all these things. And you could just put the tiniest, uh, tiniest little bit on there as well. But it really is just so pretty. And I can't, let me see, did I have my, I have taken over the whole bar here. I apologize. <laughs> I swear I'm going to get out so they can talk wine. Um, but that's a pretty, excuse me, that's a pretty nice little Mother's Day gift, you know, in bed, something like that. It'd be a nice way to go. So, um, all right, you got that, Sadie, for Mum or Sunday. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, can I make you both? Do you care for one? Do you want me to split sure. this in a glass and maybe you can try Let's a little? Split it, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, Mr. Uh, gonna add the extra champagne. <laughs> <Well, it's laughs> <in glass. laughs> see, I, I didn't add I enough. See how you are. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will put these and I'll step away so that we can keep our right. distance going. And then uh, I'll just say well, cheers. Thanks, Emily. Cheers. cheers. My so pleasure. Outstanding. I'm happy to be here with you all and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. <laughs> so, Ooh, that mint, that's cool. what do you really think? Really nice. Yeah. Ah, yay. The mint just Sweet. makes the pop and just makes it, it very refreshing. And yeah. it's, um, I mean, you think it'd be really sweet, and of course, with the fruit and the orange mm -hmm. juice, it is a little bit sweet, but it's not cloyingly sweet. Great. The mint, I think, really helps bring that. That's what I was mm. hoping for. Great. Mm. Excellent. That is good. Bye. So All don't, right. Don't mind me while I attempt to clean up some of these things while I <laughs> try right. to get out of your way here. Thank you. So <laughs> sure. before we talk about kind of the um, the pairings, um, let's uh, pop a cork and uh, sure. and talk about the fruit rosé. Sure. Yeah. The fruit rosé. This is actually one of my favorite wines that we made and uh you know corbell as a as a whole is known for its fruit forward style of winemaking and this is you know probably the most fruit forward wine that we make and so it's all about um the delicacy and the brightness of the fruit that's in here uh, the wine itself is it's a blend it's uh, made from uh, pinot noir which the pinot noir is growing here in the russian river valley uh, mostly from our state vineyards right around the winery uh, but we also blend in some sangiovese and some gamay and you know, wow, you know, uh, Sangiovese in particular, people sometimes kind of take a little step back because so you know they think of Sangiovese as the uh, primary red grape of Chianti in, in Italy, in Tuscany. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you the funny story is is we used to be affiliated with a with a, with a still wine winery that had an estate uh, Sangiovese vineyard, and uh, we had more Sangiovese than we were selling. It was a big uh, period where. You know, the Italian varieties were going to be the next big thing in California. It never really developed. And so we had this 50 acre vineyard of Sangiovese. Like, what are we going to do with all this Sangiovese? And so, you know, because, you know, the Corbell program is a bigger program, so, oh, you know what? I'll just make a little bit of Blanc Noir out of that. And, you know, we'll bury it somewhere nobody will notice. So, of course, guess what was the best tasting tank of Blanc de Noir in the entire winery? <laughs> the Sangiovese. Of course, you know. And so, Afterwards, you think, well, of course, if, you know, if you think of the, the brightness of the wines of Chianti, you know, the, that fresh fruit character when the wines are young and, and a little bit of acidity and, you know, the color is there, but it's not super intense. Perfect great for making Blanc de Noir. And that really, that variety really holds its acidity, the acidity as well, which it is does. really important. It really, it vibes, really, really does, especially in the sparkling wines, because the acidity is a big part of the structure. So that's that's the, basically the story of, of the Brut Rosé. It's you know pink wine. Uh, it's all red grapes. Uh, you know the three main ones being the Pinot Noir, the Sangiovese, and the Gamay. And uh, um, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to open up a bottle for you right now, and, and I'll show you the, the. There is a right way to open up a bottle, and it's not that there's a wrong way to open a bottle as long as you don't hit yourself in the head with a cork or spill it all over the ground. But it's a little easier if you if you do it a certain way. And really, the the main thing is you know when you take take the capsule off which i find that to be sometimes the hardest part of the process and then hold the bottle so that you can hold the cork as you undo the wire hood which is really there just for your safety so that the cork doesn't come flying out on its own because believe it or not uh, you know this bottle has about 90 psi pressure it's about three times the pressure of your car tires and so there's a huge amount of pressure in there and uh, so you really want to be careful and then what I do is I put the cork between my thumb and forefinger like this, and I hold the cork and I turn the bottle. I don't turn the cork, I turn the bottle. There you go. 
Isn't that a sweet sound? Yeah, the beautiful <laughs> sound. Oh, we're doing a little Don't social I distancing, do. but I'll, the other thing is this is kind of natural here because we are social distancing here, but that's the best way to also pour is at an angle. If you pour into your glass just like this, it kind of foams up and carbonation. But if you hold the glass at an angle as you pour, the bubbles are retained in your in your glass a little longer. There you go. Paul, is there an exact number of twists that you use to get the cage off? Yeah, it's supposed to be six, but, uh, you know, I do see variation. <laughs> it's done by a machine, so it, it's always the same. It just depends on which machine it is. So, but, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be six turns. Uh, yeah. So, anyway. So, I love the, yeah. you know, the color is so pretty. You know, how do you get that color? Or is that from the Pinot and the... Yeah, yeah, the, the, of, the, of the three varieties, uh, the Pinot is the lightest in color. And we make our rosé perhaps a little differently than you, than you do yours because we, ha we do not actually allow any skin contact. Uh, most rosés are made by crushing the grapes into a, a tank, letting them sit in the tank for a few hours or sometime a couple of days even, and then draining the juice off of, of, off of that. I don't know if that's the technique that you use or not, but uh, for us... We take the whole grapes, the entire cluster, the stem and all, and we load that into a press. And then we start pressing. And as you press, the color gets a little bit darker as you go along in the pressing cycle. And so we just select the portion of the pressing cycle that gives us the color we're looking for. And that, and that goes into the tank. Yeah. And so uh, we keep it nice and delicate and light because that's really the, the key to balance in, in a champagne is keep the wine really light and delicate. That's what this is all about. And I love that fine, you know, that really fine bead of uh, bubbles coming up mm -hmm. from the bottom of the glass. Yeah, yeah, and that's, uh, that's a hallmark of the, the process that we use. There are a variety of ways that you can get bubbles into a bottle. Um, the, by far the most common is something called Charmant Oak Process. It's about 80% or so of the world's population uh, of the production is done in that way. But the more traditional way of doing it, which is what Corbell uses, is... Uh, a method that's called method traditionnel or method champenois, and that actually involves fermenting the wine inside the actual bottle that the consumer is going to get. And so you make a base wine, and then you add a little sugar after you you know cleaned it up and blended it and filtered it and everything. Uh, you uh, you put that into the bottle with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of yeast, and it'll ferment a second time in the bottle. Now the byproduct of fermentation is two things, uh, mainly uh, alcohol and carbon dioxide gas. And since you're fermenting inside of a sealed bottle, that's where your carbonation comes from. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know where to go other than dissolving the wine. Yeah. Uh, Paul, how long is it in the bottle? It depends on the exact variety. In terms of the Brut Rosé, that is typically around nine months. And that's because we're really trying to get that fruit forward character out there. And, you know, as you age wine, that fruit character tends to dim down and you can get some very pleasant, complex type flavors with the longer term aging. But for what we're trying to do with the Brut Rosé, we're looking for it to be fresh. So the minimum is about nine months, between nine and 12 months. Or so. Well, I got to tell you, this is um, in terms of uh, the, the, the quality and value ratio. This is off the charts. You know, it is fantastic. So congratulations. Thank you. I Actually, um, you I probably wanna... saw it in the paper this morning. You got a great review in our uh, just the local uh, press Democrat. Oh, really? So, I didn't see yeah. it. I didn't see it. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So while you're having a taste of that, um, let me tell everybody about um, the rosé. Now, there's a special way to open this bottle as well. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> Actually, that one's not cold. Um, a, lot less, a lot less drama that way, huh? Okay. Perfect. Beautiful. So as Paul mentioned, uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of ways to, to make rosé. Um, one of them, one of them is really a byproduct of, of red fermentation. With most grape varieties, all of the, the colour is in the skin of the grape. So if you leave the juice in contact with the skins, that's where you get the colour from. So, um, so rosés that are made as a byproduct of, of, of red fermentations uh, tend to be a little bit um, richer and fuller, maybe a bit darker in colour and typically a little bit higher in alcohol as well. 
Um, the uniqueness of our rosé is it's all from 100% uh, Pinot Noir, grown at our two estate vineyards here in the Russian River Valley. And we grow the fruit specifically for the rosé. It doesn't get used for, for anything else. So we pick a little bit earlier than we would for our red program. So consequently, we have a lower starting sugar. So the alcohol is a little bit lower. I think we're at about 11.9% um, on, uh, on our rosé. And because we pick a little bit earlier, we really retain the brightness of the acidity. So it only stays in contact with the skins for like an hour. And that's just like uh, the Brut Rosé, you get this wonderful um, pale salmon uh, rosé colour. And the aromas here, it just, it's full of those beautiful berry fruits that, that we see in, in red Pinot Noir. You get lots of the, the berry, the cherry uh, fruit aromas, but um, a little bit different. I get um, like ruby red grapefruit and maybe watermelon. And then on the palate, really bright and elegant and, uh, and really great acidity. And uh, I think both of these wines will be kind of the, the key to the pairing is the acidity and how oh, yeah, it works yeah. with the dish. So so you've had a chance to uh, to taste. Yeah. What did you think of the pairing yeah, of the I, bubbles? I and... think it's great. Uh, both of the wines, uh, I mean, I've only had a little to taste of it here on camera, but we were, you know, I'll tell the truth, we actually tasted this ahead of time. Um, I found that they, they paired in a, in a different way. Uh, you know, you've got the richness of, of, the, of the strata, the cheese and the bread and all of that going there. And with the with the bubbles, I got a nice creaminess because you know the, the the bubbles in you know in addition to just being nice to look at, they change the texture of the wine. And they, you know, done right, they can give the you know the, the wine a real creaminess to it. And I thought that creaminess, along with the fruit profile of the wine, went very nicely with the strata. Now with the with the, the rosé of Pinot Noir that you have here, I'm loving the brightness of this. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, right. Mick was describing uh, making rosé as a byproduct of red wine production. And to be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of that because, like he was alluding to, those wines tend to be too overripe because you're picking to make this big, bold red wine and then you're bleeding. It's called saignée. You're bleeding off some of the juice. So the wine is balanced to be a red wine, but then you make this lighter pink wine out of it. Now, here, with what Mick did is they... They did it right. They did it by selecting vineyards, farming the vineyards for the Pinot, bringing it in a little earlier and preserving that acidity. And that's that brightness and the freshness of this wine is really what, what you know, it's, it's a little bit of a counterpoint to the richness of the, of the strata. For me. Yeah. And I love the I love the texture of the, of the strata as well. It's kind of gooey, chewy, um, you know, the cheese and the mushrooms, um, the egg, um, it really is good. And uh, and I think for the, the rosé, um, especially when you've got uh, the, uh, the shiitake mushrooms in there, they add that element of earthiness um, to, uh, to the dish. Yeah. Yeah. I call it forest floor, and, and that, uh, uh, that's a perfect pairing with a lot of, a lot of spark, not just Cordell sparkling wine, but a lot of uh, sparkling wine from around the world. There's a little element of earthiness to them that comes from being in contact with the yeast and the bottle. Yeah. And that's an awesome pairing with mushrooms. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, you've got kind of a, that oily um, fattiness from the cheese. So I think in both cases, the acidity in these wines really cuts through uh, the... Uh, kind of um, that richness and the texture um, of the food. And that's kind of, you know, one of the, um, uh, of what we talk about in food and wine pairing is, is having the weight of the food and the weight of the wine uh, kind of match up or having the acidity of the wine cut through the oiliness or the fattiness of the food, whether it be a steak um, or in this instance, um, that melted cheese. But uh, what a superb dish. Um, I love it. And uh, looking forward to Sadie cooking this on Sunday. <laughs> Good Nick, luck with that. Um, uh, question, is that a new bottle for the rosé? Um, yeah, actually, uh, so this is vintage 2019 um, rosé. Uh, you probably still see the 2018 uh, rosé out on the market. The characters and the style uh, are very, very similar from, uh, from year to year. 
but we went with more of a burgundy shaped bottle um, instead of a, a taller uh, Bordeaux style of, of bottle, which you might still see out in the marketplace. But. And another question, Paul, does Corbell make any other rosés? We do actually, we make uh, um, three, actually four different pink wines. Uh, a couple of them are only sold here on the winery, but out in the marketplace, we have our, our Brut Rosé, which uh, Brut refers to a medium dry style of wine. Uh, in our case, it's uh, about 1.5% residual sugar. And uh, uh, we also make a sweet rosé, which as the name you know, denotes, it's sweet. In fact, it's a funny story because uh, um, we were working with, with our marketing partners when we were developing the style of that, that wine. And we, man, we went around and around and around and around on what to call this wine and all these proprietary terms that we came up with. And then finally, I don't know who it was, but somebody said, well, the wine is sweet. We want people to know it's sweet when they buy it. Why don't we call it sweet rosé? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, both uh, both wines are very popular out there. Uh, it's interesting. They sell in different parts of the country, though. They they sell, you know uh, the heartland states, you know, in the United States tend to go more for the sweet rosé, and the coasts are tend to go a little bit more with the brut rosé. And they're very yeah, they're very different wines. Very very different. Well, Any more? While you two have uh, some wine and sparkling in your glasses, Joe from New York has told us that today is National Nursing Appreciation Day. Right. So we might want to oh, just oh, lift yeah. our glass oh, and give a little yeah. cheer to, to that. The, to the nurses. To nurses and all of uh, everybody out on, the, everybody, on the, the front line. From the, all the, from the first responders to the physicians to the orderlies to everybody out there. And that actually, uh, I, you know, since we are social this, I don't know how this is going to work on camera, but uh, Courtney, our assistant winemaker, thought that uh, uh, my mask <laughs> was too boring. So she made this, she's got young kids. And so she made this mask that is also an appreciation of, of healthcare workers. So. Okay. Kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, well, um, thank you, uh, thank you, guys. That uh, that was a really fun afternoon. The strata was fantastic. Thank I you. love the uh, the Brook Rose and what beautiful, a gorgeous property uh, is out here. Um, so again, out in the redwoods here, um, really out on the fringes of, of the Russian River Valley. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the, the fourth in, in the series. Next week, next Wednesday at three o'clock Pacific time, join us um, again for another live telecast. This time, we've got our Director of Hospitality, uh, Mark Elman. In Elkham. Mark is going to be uh, doing some grilling and, uh, and pairing it with a couple of wines, and he'll be joined by Cara Morrison, our Chardonnay winemaker. I think she's there to look over his shoulder just to make sure he doesn't burn anything or hurt himself. Um, but please join us uh, next week for uh, another one of these uh, telecasts. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, as I mentioned, you can certainly uh, go back up on YouTube and, and rerun this and any of the others um, that we've done. And like usual, uh, we're available on all of the social media uh, platforms. I don't think I need to tell you um, kind of what they are. So I hope you enjoy the afternoon. Um, I, for one, had fun and uh, enjoyed uh, <laughs> it with you guys it. this afternoon. So yeah. cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.